So welcome everybody. This is uh, a panel that we're hosting here as part of Orcon 2021, virtual Orcon. Um, this is one of the strategic on conventions uh, and specifically this is the games on demand department. Uh, my name is Tomer Grants. Uh, you can also call me Tomes. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I run games on demand uh, generally um, uh, here at Strategicon. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the main folks over at Story Games Glendale. So you'll kind of see me in those capacities where we run a lot of indie games and things. And so uh, our panel today is kind of adjacent to that. We're gonna be talking about character keepers. Uh, so you want to make a character keeper. Um, so uh, let me uh, hand the mic over to my co-panelist here, Gene, to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Gene. I go by he, him. I am also based out of uh, the hotspot known as Glendale, California. I'm a gamer, designer, guitar maker, network engineer. So if you have work, let me know. Um, I can be reached at martianmachinery.itch.io and also at www.martianmachinery.com. Awesome. Um, so uh, without further ado, let us launch into this thing. We'll have, uh, for all of you who are here in the little, uh, you know, watching live, um, there will be a Q&A thing a little bit later on. So we have some time dedicated to that. Um, feel free to write any questions at any time uh, in the chat. Uh, I believe right now it's just going to go to uh, maybe me and Jean, not to everybody else, but just write us any questions and uh, we'll get to them later on. We can also open the mics later on uh, if you have any verbal questions. So let me go ahead and share the screen. Um, and what, uh, what we'll do is just kind of go through some little basics. So uh, you know, what is this character keeper? That we'll talk about that for a few minutes. We'll go over some just kind of basic min minutia and ideas and concepts about what it can look like and what these things can do, uh, why you want to use them. And then we'll have a little bit of a, a workshop after that um, that uh, Gina will lead us through as far as like, you know, kind of how it looks like to go ahead and create these things. Uh, and then hopefully some time for questions and answers. Um, so, when I say character keeper, what am I talking about? Uh, I mean, that word can mean anything, um, right? It could mean uh, little character sheets, right? Um, uh, it, it, we're talking about something that is editable, editable by players, right? Um, and specifically, I'm talking about something that can be viewed by everybody. Now, the, there are tools out there that already do those first couple bullets. You can go onto Roll20, for example, and they have character sheets built into the tool. Um, that's not what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, we're talking about in this particular panel. So we are talking about uh, the character keepers insofar as uh, like kind of Google documents, um, generally Google Sheets, where uh, we're going to have shared access to this thing. The reason why we call these character keepers partly is because uh, that's kind of the, the word that's been used by some of the larger RPG communities like the gauntlet and stuff that have been out there for years playing online RPGs. And so this word is, eh, may not have caught on in all corners, but um, you'll, you'll kind of see that, uh, that definition. But I wanted to define it here. That is what we will be talking about. Also, you can create little shared character sheets using Google uh, Slides or using Word documents. We're also kind of leaning away from that. You can, you can do that for sure, but Google Sheets kind of lends itself uh, a little bit easier to for all sorts of reasons, whether that's kind of like programming functionality or just ease of, uh, you know, ease of use, ease of creation, things like that. So, uh, you know, why are we doing it? Um, you know, it simplifies character generation. That's an important thing. Um, you know, you can easily go through this thing from top to bottom if it's organized well and just create your character. It eases the game learning. I've played so many of these games with newbies who don't know the game and you've given them the parts that they need to focus on, right? Whether that's choosing certain stats or, you know, choosing, uh, you know, all sorts of other um, uh, story-based prompts. Um, 
one of the fantastic things about this and having these Google documents versus have each person having their own little Word document or form fillable PDF or something like that is these are shared, right? These are online links. Everybody can simultaneously edit these things, can simultaneously view the information that everybody else has. Um, and these are ubiquitous, right? Everybody has access to Google. You do not need to like professional accounts. You do not need to pay into uh, these tools. And that's a, a very big deal, right? Um, uh, and here we see like a little example uh, of, of what one might look like. We'll get more to that in a minute. Now, where can you find character keepers? Um, they're all over the place. Uh, a really good resource that has compiled a bunch of these is the Gauntlet community resources. The Gauntlet's just an online gaming community. Um, you do need to pay in if you want certain access, but it, it is free for most people. You can look that up on your own, but you'll notice the link I put there in the, um, uh, in the, share, in the screen. Um, that is, uh, they have a link there that goes to the Play Aids folder. And in the Play Aids folder, which is a Google Drive area, they have hundreds of character keepers for various indie RPGs. So a lot of smaller games, including some of the, the larger names that you'll see out there. Um, uh, another place you can find these things, of course, is by, you know, going to social media, look at the game distributor, do they have links to their own thing? Um, they might have their own tools. I mean, obviously, a lot of these bigger games will use things like Roll20 and, you know, uh, have sheets and all sorts of tools built into that. But there's a big barrier to entry to do that. That requires a lot of work and knowledge. And so you'll find with this kind of diaspora and this widespread um, you know, ecosystem of smaller indie games, this is a very easy way to create your own sheets that can be accessible, you know, for easy play in a Zoom window, right? Um, so, uh, you know, what do these look like in the simple case? How can they, you know, start to look better? Let's look at some of the, uh, the functionality that you can take advantage of in these sheets. And this is whether you create your own or you're just looking for something to use that already exists. Um, at, at the most basic, and even that this first uh, you know sheet that we're looking at, which is you know for Dungeon World, for example, um, you know this here has a whole bunch of cells in a little spreadsheet. You can see there's a column per character. Everybody can put their name there and things like that, and all sorts of other game information. In this one, you have to plug in information, so you have to plug in your your, your strength, for example, and then you'd have to change what that modifier is. Uh, you know, same with all of this stuff. You know, you have to put the information in there, copy and paste stuff or write it in yourself. Um, what you will sometimes see out there is sheets where some of this work has been done for you. The second one looks almost identical, but all those things are drop down, uh, you know, uh, little cells. So next to strength, I can choose the, the value and it will automatically fill in the modifier for me to the right. Or if you look up at the top, your character class is a dropdown and you can choose, you know, for example, the Druid and down below under moves, it automatically fills in some of those moves for you. So you can start to get kind of fancy and allow this thing to do a lot of the work so your players don't have to. This puts a little more work on whoever's designing this, but a lot less work on people wanting to use it. Um, and then finally, you can take it to that next level and start doing all sorts of fancy, beautiful work where the formatting is looking, you know, really good. And this feels like a really solid character sheet that I would have in front of me uh, put out by a professional, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's look at some examples of what these things look like. This is a really simple one. Lasers and feelings, a really simple indie game. You need almost no information for your character. So you can see how simple these sheets are. I've got one column per character. Everybody can see each other's characters so you can play off of each other. That's another great advantage of this. It's not that each person has their own sheet in front of them at a table. And I don't really remember what, you know, for example, Gene's character, um, you know, has or what, what kind of stats they have or whatever. Um, here, uh, you'll notice there's some drop downs, which again, enable you to take advantage of what the game already has. But the best thing about it is you can type in your own thing. So there's still flexibility there to be able to customize it without having to change the sheet. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, this is another game called Dreams of the Aquarium. Um, in this one, you'll see that not only is there 
character information on the bottom right, and we've got again a column per thing. You know, you can add, add pictures in uh, Google Sheets. Um, in this case, there's a whole tab with already set pictures, so you can copy and paste them in. You know, you can do it yourself. Up in the top left, we see we're playing not just with the characters and people tracking their own characters, but information about the story that we're tracking together. And you can see this on a lot of sheets where they'll use some of the safety tools that way, like lines and veils and you know what we do and don't wanna see in the game, tone, that kind of thing. So some games will take advantage of this sheet to also allow us to collaborate in creating the, the setting and the game. And then we can each have maybe our own character, for example. Um, I, I want to you know, point this out. Here are two examples. And this is an earlier um, sheet from the game Lighthearted. And then another sheet on the bottom right from uh, Space Post. And both of these, one thing I want you to notice is the columns. Like if you look at the very top grid, you know, the letters A, B, C, D, et cetera, those are the columns from Google Sheets. And they have specifically been made to be really small, right? So what you have here is a grid, right? It's basically like looking at one of those graph paper grid pages. And what this has allowed these people to do, including Gene, who designed, you know, some of this, um, is really play with the formatting. You'll notice that you can merge a lot of these cells and then you have a lot of flexibility here, right? So like if you look at the space post one on the bottom right, you know, uh, you can really kind of create these columns based on uh, how you want to do it. By default with Google Sheets, like you can only kind of put formatting in each column. And here, this has allowed you to really have granular control. And if you look at these sheets, they look really good, right? I mean, you can see how, uh, you know, all these boxes are like form fitted to kind of perfectly capture whatever information you're looking for. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, here's a, another thing that these sheets are able to do. And I think, uh, Maybe we saw a little bit of this. Uh, actually, I think we didn't on the Dreams of the Aquarium one, but this one is another game called Amidst Endless Quiet. And here up at the top, yeah, there's some character information, but down below, we can see that this sheet is actually keeping track of the game flow. So each uh, round of the game, a different action is being taken. And so not only is this you know, keeping track of your information as a character, it's keeping track of what is happening each round and who is involved. Right, um, so you can use the sheets to do something like that. Right, um, uh, and I, I want to point out as well, like what, here when somebody chooses one of these actions, and you can see down at the bottom, the drop-down list has been kind of uh, selected here, so you can see some of the the different options. When somebody's chosen one, like you know, observe, it gives you automatically. It kind of brings in this short description of what that scene is about. Again, this just makes playing the game so much easier. Um, so the barrier to entry for new players is just reduced, right? This works for some smaller indie games, maybe not others, but um, a couple of other things you can do, right? Like there's some games where you're sitting at a table and there's a bunch of index cards, right? And you know, maybe we don't own characters or we're creating them collaboratively or whatever. So the example here is the final girl. And in that game, we have a whole bunch of index cards in front of us, and then we pick and choose, uh, you know, characters in different scenes. You can see what they did here. This isn't a very flashy character keeper, but what they've done is when cards have been X'd out, they've been marked red. So we don't, you know, that's easy to go, okay, we no longer need these guys, they, they've moved on. But also during a scene, when we have different players controlling different characters, you can kind of color code it. And that doesn't take too much work, there's probably more fancy ways to do this, but at a minimum, this is something you could set up in, you know, five minutes and have a game running already. Um, of course, there are other tools online to do things like, uh, like this, but, you know, the fact that you can get creative and do things like this in Sheets is also worth highlighting. Um, and you can get even more creative. So this is a, a sheet that plays StarCrossed, um, you know, two-player love game using a Jenga tower normally. And a Jenga tower is extremely hard to emulate online, but there's a couple of articles out there that talk about how to do that, um, including this one that talks about how to use, uh, for example, rolling D20s. And this sheet does this magnificent job of not just using that 
mechanic, but also hiding some of the obfuscating some of the things that you want obfuscated. So you don't want to, for example, know what numbers have already been chosen, which is over on the left there, you can see like which numbers people have chosen and how many times they've been chosen. And but over on the right, you know, if I'm playing the game up on the top right, you can see it kind of just tells me, you know, uh, how many numbers have been chosen how many times, but not which numbers they are. So it's just kind of giving me an, a feel for how unstable the tower is, in quotes, um, without telling me exactly how to avoid causing it to fall. So I'm, I'm abbreviating it, but again, very interesting things that you can do with these sheets where you're able to emulate something physical in this kind of virtual gaming world with, you know, pretty good results. So... We're talking, we talked about the sheets themselves and you know why you'd want to use them, but why would you want to make them? So uh, these sheets are not available for all games. Not all game uh, designers are doing things like this. Um, uh, you know, and so it's sometimes incumbent upon us as the players to put together a sheet that we want to use. Um, so it makes playing easier, character creation easier, it's easier to teach the game without having to go through all the details because the sheet's doing some of that work. But it also, like if you're a game designer yourself, I mean, this is this is marketing, right? You've just you've not just created a rule set and you've gone through great pains to make this game as clear as possible. You can now also create this tool that people can use online, especially during pandemic year. And uh, you know, I think moving forward, we will still see a lot of online gaming. Um, and now you've just made it easier for people out there who want to enjoy your game to be able to play with their friends online. So uh, you can also think of it as some kind of marketing exercise. Um, but yeah, you're just reducing that barrier to entry for people to be able to play and enjoy your game or other games that you want to put out there. Um, so before we go into this awesome uh, uh, demo stage, just a couple of basics. We're not really going to discuss these. This is not training in how to use Google Sheets, um, but uh, you know, a couple of tools that are worth highlighting is things like text wrapping, you know, in cells, using borders to make things, you know, kind of uh, cool and eye pleasing, and knowing, you know, for a player where to concentrate your your focus. Um, alignment. Um, in, within the cells, you know, do you want your text on the left or the right? Because sheets are, you know, traditionally for things like doing math and finance stuff and whatever, you will see that numbers by default go over to the right because you want them to be mathy and words won't. So, you know, if you're going to want to play with this to just make it look pretty, you want to play with all these kind of functions. Um, fill colors. Uh, I highlighted specifically certain ones that I personally like. I like these kind of muted ones because that way you can see the text behind it. But, you know, there's lots of different ways to use this kind of stuff. Um, again, because this is used a lot of times for finance and math, the formatting you, uh, for numbers can be changed, especially very easily. Like, do you want it to be doing mathy stuff or not? Um, and uh, a very important tool that a lot of people don't know exists is the format painter. Um, anybody who's, you know, for work has to use these uh, Microsoft, you know, tools or these Google tools or whatever um, may have run into this. Uh, but this is a very easy way to take an existing cell that you've already formatted, you know, with your right alignment and colors and, you know, maybe text font choices. You can easily go to that cell, grab this little format painter tool, and paint other cells that way without having to redo all the work. Um, so be aware of that one. And of course, as you get into the advanced stuff, there are functions that allow you to do things like, you know, sum up numbers and whatever. Also important, they added a checkbox at some point, which is awesome. So you can very easily do things like either track you know, different things like stress or stats that a game might have or uh, otherwise have selections. Um, so some of the basics of, uh, this is where we'll look at tips and tricks. Um, you know, when you're doing this thing, use test data. Don't just make the sheet and then expect it all to work. Like fill in the information with a fake character, or a fake player. So you can see that the formatting looks good and fits correctly. And that way you don't have to fix formatting later. Uh, keep it simple. Um, you can actually even see this sheet on the slide, which is, you know, it, it does the trick. It's not bad, right? But 
it, there's a lot of colors going on there and it might be a little hard for my eyes to understand where I'm supposed to look. You know, there's a lot of text, which is bold and big. And some of that's great because those are important things, but you know, I, I'm having a hard time parsing this quickly and easily. That might be because it's a complicated game. So maybe there's no way to avoid that to some degree. But, you know, I, I have my thoughts on how I would start to already play with the formatting here. Um, some advanced stuff, you know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of fonts available in Google. Uh, colors, images, feel free to like mimic the game in some way. So that way you're evoking what that game looks like. So if you were looking at the rules next to this sheet, you'd be like, oh yeah, that belongs to the right game. Um, we saw some of those grid style columns making really small columns. So that way we can merge and, you know, format things the way we want. Um, however, that adds a lot of complexity as we'll see. Um, and you, you know, if you didn't get the formatting right, now you have to unmerge things and replay around with it. That could take a lot of work. So make sure you kind of like, you know, figure that out before putting too much work into it um, to avoid having to redo it. Uh, there's a function in these sheets. And, you know, if you're an Excel wizard from the past called data validation, you can do things like make dropdown lists really easily. And that way you can update fields and the dropdown list kind of automatically, you know, uh, yeah, fixes itself, if you will. Uh, and finally, you can use all sorts of spreadsheet programming stuff. Um, I, you can go online and figure it out yourself if you don't know it already, but uh, you can also look at existing sheets out here that are already doing these things and just try to kind of figure it out. Of course, you know, the more you know about computers and programming, the, the easier it'll be, but um, you know, you don't have to figure it out yourself or, uh, uh, or start from scratch. Um, so as an example here, I'm going to give one more example before we jump forward here. Uh, this is a, you know, I wanted to create a drop down list. And here I have a whole bunch. This is from a game called Lady Blackbird. I have a whole bunch of these keys and, you know, they have descriptions and things. And what I did on the character sheet is, uh, you know, I made this pretty formatted looking area, but I set it. So I first made a drop down list, right? And this is, you know, one of the cells on the sheet. And you can see that if I go to data validation, which is a part of the Google Sheets thing, I can say where I want to get these values from. So it's like now that dropdown list is getting all the values from that other list, right? And so if I clicked on that little triangle, it would show me all these values, key of the traveler, key of the broker, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to go further. Like, I don't want to just choose one of these things from the list. I actually wanted to fill in the values underneath. So what I did next is if you look at the two cells underneath there, they're using some, you know, programming functions and you can see it right here. They're doing these kind of like lookups and they're saying, okay, whatever values up there at the top in that first cell, go over to this other sheet and then look next door and grab that text and put it down below, right? So if I change key of the Paragon to key of the Traveler or something like that, it will automatically go to the sheet, grab that other stuff from the next two cells and stick it in those, you know, those two bottom cells. So it's kind of doing a lot of work for you because that's what computers are good at, right? That does require you to kind of like play around with these functions. Do I understand what all those values mean? I don't need to. Right, um, you know, you just kind of need to know which numbers to tweak to make this thing work for you. And the easiest way is just kind of play around with an existing sheet and figure it out. Um, cool. So before I hand it over to Gene, just reference material, I would highly recommend checking out Michael G. Barford's amazing blog posts on the Gauntlet blog. He goes through four different posts and they go through, you know, what is this character keeper thing in kind of the same way I have uh, some basics. And then he goes into some advanced stuff and kind of like shows you these things step by step in just a blog. Um, so that's a really great place to look to start. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're in an Internet age. So go Google stuff. There are, you know, training resources out there for how to use Google Sheets or Excel. If you have learned Excel in the past or are learning that, it's not very different from a lot of the functionality you'll find on Google. Um, you know, uh, and then uh, look at other sheets, see what they do. Try to do that thing. Um, uh, and 
Well, one, one other example I do want to give, I, for, I forgot to do this, but let me uh, bring it over. Th this is another cool uh, example, which uh, one of our locals here, uh, Mo Poplar's put together. This is for uh, his game Shibuya Nights. And I want to show you what it does. Like this is still an early phase of the sheet, but you'll notice that, you know, you start filling out the sheet and there's this kind of like red area and the red text here. And it's talking about, you know, what to do as starting in character generation. And as you go and do it and you choose, you know, a value, it starts highlighting the next thing, right? So it's like, okay, well, put in your name, you know, or whatever, and then select a fee. Okay, uh, I'll do that. I'll select that one. And then it says, adjust your actions. And it's kind of highlighted the next phase. So one thing that this sheet has done, which is really cool, is it's kind of guided you through the character creation process. So again, um, there is a lot of pretty cool kind of, you know, maybe fancy things that you can do. Um, uh, but yeah. So uh, Gene, you ready for a workshop? Sure. And just time check, we are th almost 30 in. So that gives us 30 minutes. I think I'm going to do 15 minutes of um, stuff, right? Does this sound right? Tom. That sounds great. And thanks for being patient with me. I, I probably took a little bit longer than I wanted, but go for it. All right. I thought it was fine. Um, so stop sharing, and then I will share in a minute. So um, let me figure this out. Oops. Come on. OK. Um, before I kind of drill into this, um, Tomary, you can see everything. And yes, we're good. OK. So just a couple of things to add to what Tomer was talking about, just sheets in general. We didn't talk about the downsides of why you would not want to do it. Um, I will have to say that using a shared document is a protocol that you have to learn because you can do a bunch of things in these documents. You could, for example, mess with Joe's character one cell over and not know anything. You could also wipe the sheet out for everyone. Um, you have a lot of control as the editor if you're just even just playing. So. Um, the table is going to have some discipline that they're going to have to learn. So that's one downside. The other downside is, um, you know, the learning curve. Like some people are not just going to get it and they're going to, have to figure it out and you're going to have to help them. Um, there are also like interesting quirks about sheets. For example, two people can't be in the same cell at the same time. That is just something you're going to have to figure out. Um, it is like anything online that, you know, now that we're doing a bunch of Zoom calls, everyone knows Zoom protocols, but a year ago, not everyone did. So if, if you're gonna use these kind of tools, you're gonna have to learn into that. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that um, if you're gonna design a keeper for a game that you're not making, you probably should ping the designer first because two things are gonna happen. Either they've already made one, maybe three things. They've already made one, they're gonna say, oh, I. I already made one, you can just use this one. Um, the other thing is that they might be feel a little weird about you creating a keeper for them because some of these games that, that I like to play are very light on rules and it's quite possible for you to put the entire game on the sheet, um, which they will feel weird about. Um, they really can't do anything about it, but that's the wrong way to think about this. You kind of want to think in terms of like, like uh, what the designer would like to do. And um, they're usually cool about it. Um, so that's the other thing. The third thing is that, um, the, the third thing is that it's just a good dialogue, right? So, so keep that in mind before you make your own sheet. Anyway, onto this thing, I have a few minutes. I'm just gonna show you some things. So um, this first slide, well, they're not really slides, I'm just sharing my screen, but this is what um, we used to do before we had Google Sheets. This is from a d, d game I ran quite a while ago. So before we get into the notion like, well, why should I do this in a spreadsheet? Well, we're already doing it in spreadsheets when we play in real, in real time and in person. Um, it's just a bunch of numbers. This, I, right here's arm class hit points and a bunch of columns. I, I don't know why I was drawing this person over here, but uh, we're already doing this kind of thing. So the first thing, like the first thing that most people need to get over is the fact that it's on the computer. Um, once you realize that you're doing this anyway, you will say, oh, I could just do it on the computer. Here's a good tool. It'll translate directly. All right. So I'm just going to show you some uh, keepers that I've been involved with or that I like. So 
what I'm showing you here is probably the sheet that has influenced me the most. This is for a game called Good Society by Story Brewers. It was designed by V. Hendro. Um, basically, if you kind of look at design lineages, this is kind of a distillation of the stuff that was being done at the gauntlet, I want to say two years ago. So um, it has an intro slide. It has a collaboration slide. On here, you decide the settings of the game. There's some nice formatting. This is all in tune with, with the book itself and the in-person materials. Um, the character sheet has all the characters on one page. Um, thin column on the right, it has um, some of the game functions on the right. Um, this, this game itself is very heavy on boxes. So um, V is a professional designer. Um, she's done a bunch of games in, in addition to Story Brewers. So um, I think she did a good job. If I were to make any comment on it, and you know, who am I? I would say I'm not in love with these fonts because I think they're a little hard to read. That's just me. Anyway, um, what I do like about it is that all the characters are on one sheet. Um, you can get five characters across in a 1920 by four, um, sorry, by 1080 screen, which is super useful. So uh, again, this is for a good society. Now, one of the reasons, like the biggest reason you'll be creating sheets is you'll be creating sheets for games that don't have a keeper. This, this sheet I made was is for a game called um, Damn the Man Save the Music by Hannah Schaefer. And it's built on a Norlandia, um, the Norlandia engine. There is no sheet, online sheet for it. So I had to create one to play it. Um, without really getting into the game, it's basically Empire Records, that movie from the 19, I want to say 1995, um, the game didn't have one. So um, I created one and this is what it looks like. Um, it's a lot of boxes. There's not a lot of programming on this one because there's not a lot in the, in the game in terms of um, things we need to do in formulas or um, data validation. The game itself, like the, the one big challenge on this game, and this is probably out of scope for this talk, is that the game functions on cards. Like, uh, I'm going to highlight these on row 31, 32. Um, that is something that is kind of external to a sheet. You can, you can create a, a, a card deck in Google Sheets. You can do it. You can create a, a data list and then have it randomly draw a card out of it. It's just not going to do it well. And there are other other um, tools online that'll do a that'll do a deck, especially if you want to do a custom deck. Like it's one of those challenges that. Um, follows keepers. Um, most people get around it with lists. And uh, to, as Tomer knows, you can do a lot with a list. Um, but just FYI, cards are difficult to do with a keeper. They can be done, um, especially in conjunction with other tools. Anyway, so th I created this one for this game because it just doesn't exist. Um, and this is one of those games where it's fairly obscure so you are going to have to put things in it that you wouldn't normally put on a sheet for example uh this this is the player's guide it's a one pager it's actually very similar to what's in the book right now but this is basically your move sheet um so you're going to have to include these on some of the games that, that you're trying to do especially if it's not a, a, a well-known system or if it's something that's not pbta for example or even if it's P PBTA, because PBTA has some ex expectations of its own. Like there is a move, usually a basic move sheet for most PBTA games. Um, and then I have a notes thing. So I made this from Dan, for um, Damn the Music. Um, I'm sorry, Damn the Man, Save the Music. And this is about a year old. So this next thing I want to show is Rob's game, which is Demon Castle Dracula. Uh, now, most of us know Rob, Rob's in, in the audience now. Demon Castle Dracula is a game that does um, Transylvania. Or um, Rob is a better pitch for this. <laughs> but uh, the thing I wanted to, to denote on this is that Rob is an artist and he does great work. So um, the keeper that I helped him put together has the art on it. And what I wanted to show is that um, I took the palette straight from the, the artwork. So I didn't have to create these colors. You can eyedropper the palette and uh, work it into the sheet. 
Um, so this is the game. Um, the game itself mostly functions on keeping track of things on your sheet. And that is, there's not much calculation. You're mostly checking things off as you go through. So check boxes are used uh, quite a bit. Um, we had a discussion once about whether we can do radio boxes in a character keeper. You cannot. Um, radio boxes are a uh, interactive functionality that you see in um, on web sheets, but it's really not in a Google sheet because Google Google sheet is ultimately a spreadsheet when you come down to the tech. So um, it does not have that functionality at this point. Anyway, you can play the game entirely on this. Um, it has a lot of the rules in it, and that's something that Rob wanted to um, to do. And I, I now include credits pages on the, on the sheets I put together. So that's Demon Castle Dracula. This next series of keepers are keepers for a game called Girl by Moonlight by um, Andrew Gillis. And um, Girl by Moonlight is basically a Sailor Moon forged in the dark game. So it runs off blades in the dark. Um, many of the things in it um, have a high degree of calculation. I'm not sure how familiar you are with Blades in the Dark, but um, one of the inter interesting things about Blades is that um, it is well represented online. You can go to Roll20 and Strash and their team has put together an excellent Blades in the Dark sheet um, that does a lot of the calculations. Um, so reproducing that in, in Google Sheets has some challenges. And I'm gonna show you a couple different approaches. So. Um, I believe this one was written by our friend Leandro. It is um, a fairly fill in the blank kind of sheet. So you have four characters here. And most of the things that you would do here is you would look stuff up like your look, for example. And um, I'm, I'm remembering um, Tamara's example with drop down list that would just kind of, you would drop down these in, in other sheets. But in this implementation, you have the, the game material separately or in a separate tab and you as the, the, the player who's designing the character would cut, cut and paste that into here. Same thing with this. Um, this is a fully functional sheet. You can play this game. People have played this game with this sheet, but it is, it is reliant on a lot of cut and paste and a lot of, keep, a lot of uh, keeping track of things. I can't click into this because I'm just looking at a view only copy, but uh, um, the, one of the interesting things about the um, Blades in the Dark system is a lot of it runs on boxes. You're, you're counting boxes to determine your dice pool. So um, it actually actually goes really well with this. So you just count the number of boxes, it kind of does its thing. And again, these special abilities on another sheet, these, this would be a V lookup. And that, that would mean that you, uh, you either choose it from a pick list or you would choose um, one decision and it'll start filling stuff in for you. There are a couple ways to do this and I'll explain um, some of them in a minute. What you'll see on these sheets is that um, they're sometimes a data sheet and many of these sheets have them hidden. So a lot of the tables that you see um, might exist on a keeper that you pick up online from Gauntlet, for example, they might have a hidden data sheet where all the, all the cool stuff is happening. Anyway, so this is, the same game. This is Girl by Moonlight. And this is um, something that Jammy put together for um, uh, uh, for their game. I would say, though, um, Girl by Moonlight is a little different because based on the play set, you can have a very different game. So it's, so although you could play, um, I believe, uh, it, the, the setting really is called In a Maze of Dreams. I believe that you can play In a Maze of Dreams with a play set you I'm sorry, with the sheet that you just had seen, the keeper that Leandra made. This one is made specifically for it. And um, it adds a bunch of things that are very specific to that play set. And um, um, there's obviously a more emphasis on um, collaboration. This collabor collaboration sheet is uh, pretty built out. It also does something that's um, it's very different. And that is, Unlike the previous sheets, including the ones that I made, um, Jammy decided to, to have one tab per character. And this is more in line with what you're thinking of when you play at a table. Like, hey, I have my own tab. This is my domain as a player. No one's going to mess with it. Um, that is a perfectly fine approach. Um, you, can, you can have that one tab per character 
per player thing. Um, it's 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 a different paradigm, and it's very useful. I think it works for certain games more, and uh, we can explore what that looks like. But I do think ultimately that you're better served, even if you have separate tabs, to have a summary um, that kind of collates all this info onto a sheet. And you, that's very easy to do in a spreadsheet. Not so easy in, with paper, but um, in a spreadsheet, it's very easy to say, I'm going to pull all the character names and put them here. I'm going to pull all the player names, associate them with the characters, and pull out all the important relevant data and put it on one sheet. Um, this is a pretty amazing um, series of sheets because um, we were talking about previously that you have, uh, you, you can do these abilities, these boxes right here on a, on a lookup, like decide, you could have had strangers a pull down and then fill in all these boxes on a sheet. You could, do, done, you could have done this programmatically, but, but um, Jamie decided not to do that here. So it's a different approach. It's pretty cool. Um, I will say in, in actual practice, what this means though, is because there's so many sheets, you as a GM, if you're running this game, have to go through and check every sheet to make sure that it's accurate. Because again, I could click this box and no one would know that I clicked it. So you would have to go back and double check everything. So just FYI. So one more uh, Girl by Moonlight sheet. This is the sheet I put together as a play test, uh, I want to say a year ago. I needed to do, to do the Kingdom of Dawn play set, right? which is a different play set within the same system. And this is the sheet I put together. This is kind of a mix. It is a giant list of boxes. I mean, a giant thing of boxes and a giant um, uh, sheet of uh, data. But this is another way to do it. I wanted to put all the characters on on one page, so I did that. And it's just another approach. Would I do this differently? And that's why I'm hesitating when I look through this, because I haven't seen it in a year. I would definitely do this differently. But it, it does what it does. And that is play the game, play the specific play set. I do not have all the collaboration stuff on the um, on many different sheets. I have it on one sheet. And uh, if you were to look at the Girl by Moonlight play aids, the actual physical character sheet, this is very similar to what it looks like there. So um, there you go. Anyway, so just I wanted to, to show that you can do the same game many different ways, and all of them are valid. OK, so I wanted to show just one more thing. I'm creating a game right now. Um, and it's called Hearts and Ravens in this, but it's not going to be called that in the end. And I kind of wanted to, I'm working on this game now, so I'm working on the sheet simultaneously, simultaneously, and I kind of wanted to show what it looks like. So basically, this is what I start off with when I make any sheet. I have the sheet concept in mind, either I've done it physically on a piece of paper, or I have it in some other text document. I basically put everything I want to be on this character sheet onto a spreadsheet. And Tamara showed some of my early sheets where I just made grids and, and kind of mapped it out that way. I don't do that anymore, although I could. Um, I, kind of, uh, I kind of do this thing where I'm now kind of um, mapping things out visually just by putting all the data on one sheet. And once, when you do this, you kind of see um, ways to do things. And I'll show you the actual sheet in a minute. Um, one of the things that happens here is that the sheet is wider than I want it to be. It has proficiencies and abilities on kind of um, three columns. And I really wanted to uh, make this more narrow. Um, I also did things, this game has some, some kind of like Mad Libs kind of things. Um, I, I kind of had to figure out how to do that. Um, there are various approaches to do fill in the blank kind of things. And um, I did some of the, those things here. So. Um, I want to blank because blah, 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 because of this. So here I'm kind of exploring programmatically what it would look like. Again, there are different ways to do this. Um, this is what the sheet looks like. So um, I went from that, um, you know, everything on one sheet, everything, all the data is there to this. Um, it's, it's a lot of boxes. The um, the game is built around World of Dungeons as well. One of world, one of the roots is World of Dungeons, 
And um, there's a lot of boxes in that game. So this is what it looks like on the right. And again, I wanted to show that Good Society game early because I'm taking some of the ideas there. I'm putting some of the game management tools on the right and trying to put as many characters as I can on the same page. Um, I also have the rules. I have some tables in here. Um, the game is in the super early phase. So I am mostly using the sheet to work out some ideas. So, and that's perfectly valid too. Uh, one of the um, one of the things you'll you'll notice when you start doing this for yourself, or that you may have already noticed, is that this is actually a really cool design tool as well. You can work out some ideas um, just creating this sheet. Um, so that's one thing. And I wanted to show what the sheet looks like when it's populated. So I ran play tested the game. I want to say a week ago, and this is what people did with it. Um, there's a box for images. Those are uh, captures that they got from um, the web. Um, they put in the descriptions here. Um, this, this field expands as needed. Um, there's a lot of NPCs that the characters control. Um, these are the boxes here for that. Um, some of the things I'm looking at now, like things to fix, like, uh, like uh, Tamara was talking about alignment. Um, I would change the vertical alignment to these, right? Because some of these are at the bottom and some of these are at the top. I would change them all to be central. And that's stuff that you can only tell after you play test the sheet, basically. Um, and that is that. The other thing to consider is that you don't have to do this in Google Sheets. You can, you can play a game in any other document and uh, any other document manager. Google Sheets does afford the power of having spreadsheet programming built into it. And that is the real advantage of it. Um, I, I have done Rule 20 programming because I am a programmer. Um, if you do something in Rule 20, you're gonna have to know some, some, some languages. You're gonna have to know JavaScript basically. It's not difficult, it's a simple markup, but it is programming. It doesn't look anything like this. Um, when you design in sheets, it's usually visual. So if that is your strength, you can do it. Um, and you do some okay things. Cool, and that's it for me, Tomer. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, I will, uh, hold on just a second. There we go. Um, I do want to show off one other thing as well, and then we're going to go to, you know, I'll kind of, we'll do the little wrap up and then Q&A. Um, one of the things that, uh, Jean, I know you mentioned was, uh, and you should be able to see my screen here, um, is uh, the there's sheets, for example, on safety tools and giving credits, for example, that's a great thing, or like having like a cover page where you talk about the game or to buy it. Um, and uh, a lot of sheets nowadays also have these kind of like either expectations or safety tool type um, areas. And this is also a great way for people to collaboratively do that. Uh, one thing I like about this one, for example, which uses kind of like a lines and veils um, to say, well, I might not want this. Oh, I'm really excited about that. Is this one actually set it up? You can see programmatically, if I said, hey, I do not want a certain topic, it automatically kind of like covers over the other options because what you don't want is somebody saying, yes, I want it. And somebody saying, no, I don't. We want to give preference to the fact that, you know, if somebody does not want that there, then it will not be there. I thought that was kind of cool. And again, to the cards thing. Uh, yeah, like there, there are ways to do things like you know, choose specific cards or as the game goes on, you know, you're doing things like, uh, you know, setting up kind of like a play board. And this is what I've done here with this particular play test. And just like Gene was saying, this was just a test. This is not what the game will look like, but this is how I could get it to the table in a virtual way as quickly as possible. Um, notice, however, I am using the art here. This is from Anjang. It's one of a thousand thousand islands. Uh, by ZXU and Moncow, uh, their art is here, right? So like, I have not distributed this, this was for a private play test, but that's the kind of thing that you will need to consider is getting in touch with these folks and getting permissions. Cause you know, putting in their art, putting in their words, like they can't prevent you from creating a sheet to run their game. But if you're copying and pasting their actual game text, 
um, as I did here, like some of the actual setting text is, you know, verbatim posted in there. So me distributing this in a public way may have certain repercussions. You do want to contact these designers, see if they're cool with it. Again, a lot of times they love it because it's getting their work out there, but it's good to ensure that you have kind of permissions to do that and you're not burning bridges and that type of thing. So those were great points. Thank you, Gene. Um, so before we jump into Q&A, um, I just want to give a, a shout out. Thank you, uh, Jay, especially because I, I do not believe we would be doing panels this time around um, if uh, she didn't kind of get that stuff moving. So I wanted to send a shout out and appreciation for that. Um, and uh, before we go to like wrap up or anything like that, I do want to give some time for audience questions. We have a few minutes. I'm going to actually go to the settings here and allow anyone to unmute themselves and anyone to start their video if they would like. So if you want to set a question that way, you can. You can also send it in the chat thing and you can raise your hand if you want to be called on. So let us know if you have any questions. Uh, one from Joe, uh, but before I get to that, uh, go ahead. Are you on there? Is that she? Oh, she? I, yes. I thought that you were talking about Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, well, I saw Joe, just someone in the chat, so let me grab that one. Uh, question, are there ways to lock out certain portions of a sheet after a player has filled in their information, thinking about ways to minimize accidental clicking or editing? Um, I'll answer real quick from my angle and then hand it over to Gene. Uh, you can lock cells and you can lock whole sheets. So you can set permissions uh, in that way. And some of that permission isn't just necessarily disabling somebody from doing something, but maybe even bringing up like a, hey, warning, you're about to change this cell kind of thing. Um, I know for one of the sheets that I was working on before, I set up the whole sheet um, and all the boxes where players are supposed to make changes, I left those open, but all the other formatting, I made sure to lock those down. And that way they can't accidentally, or it makes it more difficult for them to accidentally mess with the formatting or, or errantly like screw up the sheet. Um, and that, that can be useful, right? As Gene was mentioning before. Uh, Gene, do you have anything with that? I think that's accurate. Um, if you can get into some really granular um, security controls or um, permission controls, um, almost always though that implies that you're, you're, you have a certain level of restriction on the sheet itself. And that is um, you set it to not be in anyone can edit mode. Um, so you will have to know people's Google's, Google accounts if you wanna get, get very granular with permissions. So it's kind of, it's, there's a tier above four and that is like knowing how Google works in general. So you can do it. People have done it, um, but it is it is involved. Awesome. Uh, she, did you have a question? Um, I had two questions and one of them kind of follows up the Joe's question. So for kind of security manner, like if we uh, make changes without even noticing or uh, like, Apparently, those uh, spreadsheets are very big and have many tabs, or like it could be uh, just a one spot that has information there that we were not aware of. So I was thinking of maybe two ways, but I am obvious, and like um, I don't have experience. So one way is like it, it's possible to ha have a reset button so that you kind of click it and reset to the original. And then another way is to, uh, like you do have a original um, spreadsheet somewhere and you use the compare button of compare that to the original one and see if this like uh, highlights any difference over there. I just, I just want to know whether that's possible ways to help us. Yeah, I think my, my first thought with the reset button is that can cause as much trouble as, <laughs> you know, the other stuff, right? If somebody accidentally hits that button. But I think both of those are, are valid options. I think uh, one thing that's, you, you know, useful to think about is if this is a sheet I've made for, let's say, my game, somewhere on that sheet, you know, I have my credits page, I have links to where to buy my game, whatever. 
you might also want to have a link to the original game because people can make copies of this game depending on what permissions you set. Generally, you're going to let people make a copy of the sheet so they own it now in their drive and they can make whatever changes they want without affecting, of course, you know, my primary sheet as a developer. Um, however, once they do that, you know, anybody looking at their sheet may not see where it came from. So having, you know, a link to, you know, my itch page, my wherever, you know, you can, you originally get this thing. Maybe you even have a shortened URL, which points to the original sheet. So as I update it and make changes, that's where they can, you know, get the most current version. You might want to have that somewhere on your sheet as well, even if that's not the current sheet they're looking at. And you could use that for that compare. Uh, Gene? So yeah, yeah uh, there are a couple ways to do it one of the better ways is to export your data after sessions and just have a local copy. You could also just copy the entire um, character keeper. Um, it, 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 like Tomer said, it's kind of a tricky thing. And what I said earlier about people are just gonna have to learn the online protocol of doing things. Um, if people are on the same page there, then you don't need to even worry about that. But I personally make copies between each session because um, if you have like a, a long campaign, anyone could go there, go into your sheet at any point and change things if they wanted to. So I always back up stuff up. Um, not so much because I don't trust my players, but you can click anywhere and change something and just forget about it, for example. Um, but yeah, uh, the best tool for, for like mass comparisons is to export stuff out and to use something like Excel or something more powerful or something more programmatic to, um, to do the comparisons for you. And I think that's a great point of the copy. They make it so easy, assuming you're not running into your storage limits here on Google Drive or whatever. They make it trivial to just make a copy of the thing. So if you were, for example, running a three month long campaign and every week you were playing, you could just make a copy to kind of like keep track of where things were and just have those copies as, you know, maybe a resource, but maybe just in case somebody screws something up somewhere down the line, you can go back to the last week and you know, figure out what happened or copy and paste things that may have been screwed up. Um, but yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to jump into the chat. There's a question from Rob. What are some resources for learning the backend stuff or common useful functions? I think we covered some of it, but like, <clears throat> I highly recommend, you know, like there's a couple of like Udemy or, you know, I think LinkedIn bought one of those companies, a so LinkedIn learning, for example, or a lot of tutorial videos you'll find on YouTube from various folks. So those are some places where I will go just because I don't want to, like, I'm not personally trying to learn uh, that as an overall tool. I just, I need those little task-based things, right? I just need to learn how to do this one thing. And like I said, for me, what's very useful is seeing what's already done out there and then just trying to like, um, you know, go in and, and figure it out. Um, uh, kind of reverse engineer it. Um, so uh, oftentimes, like like we were showing, and Gene mentioned, like a VLOOKUP, for example, is a function that's in here. If you know that that, that function exists and kind of what it does, or even if you don't and you just happen to run into it in one of these cells, you can look that up specifically, of course, and then that may give you enough information to figure out how to utilize it. Um, what are your thoughts, Gene? I think that for the support for Google Sheets itself is extensive. I mean, um, uh, you know, we're using this as keepers, but of course people use this as a productivity tool for all kinds of things. And you can do crazy, crazy things with it. So um, one of the things to do when you look up this material is to not think of it as a character keeper. You have to think of it as a tool first. Someone else has done this um, to fix their business spreadsheet or to do something else with it. and I, when I, um, when I look up how to do something that there's usually a bunch of uh, examples, um, but they're not, none of them are about character keepers. So we're kind of like mining a very specific subset of, of the tool to do a very specific thing, but um, there's so many resources to do everything about this tool at this point. Um, I will say too, though, that functionality wise, I think overall Sheets is slightly behind something like Office 365. There are a couple things you can do in Office 365 that you can't do in um, in Sheets, and that is because um, Office 365 leverages Excel directly. So there you go. Awesome. Um, 
another question. Do you mind sharing the link of the spreadsheet that would highlight the next steps um, from she? Um, yeah, we, we can talk about that. We're about to wrap up here, but I um, I do want to, to that point, I want to note uh, two things. Uh, once this is done, we're, we hope to have this re recording out on YouTube. So if you're watching it currently uh, on YouTube, um, down in the description um, under the video, we should have links to whatever we can provide uh, legally and logistically. Um, so that includes, you know, information about how to get in touch with us, possibly where to see, you know, games that we're working on. Um, and uh, I'll put resources for links to the games that I used as examples. Um, and uh, yeah, check out the notes. Um, uh, Jean, do you have anything to add before we do kind of like the wrap up? Just for she's question. Fortunately, Mo is in the chat, so I'm pretty sure we can get you two connected on on some of the great programming uh, he did on his sheet. So, um, yeah, to that point, we are here at a uh, virtual Orcon. Um, when we jump back into the you know the Discord or whatever, um, you know, feel free to get in touch with us. We we've uh, I know most of these people are commonly around, and we can feel free to chat. Uh, with it. I know we have something else coming up right now, so I'm going to have to shut this down. But before I leave, I just, again, my name is Tomer Grants. You can call me Tomes. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, you'll see me here at Strategicon. You'll see me at Story Games Glendale, which is a meetup that we now this year run virtually, um, where we both play indie RPGs and story games. And we also do uh, an RPG makers meetup on, you know, bi-weekly uh, on one or the other um, and again, I just want to give uh, a shout out to uh, Jay, who helped uh, make sure this was happening today, so uh, and that we got these panels done. We have another one uh, a little bit later today at four o'clock in the afternoon, which is Women of Color at the Table, um, and it'll be Jay and two other uh, fine folk, and uh, I implore people to come and watch it. Uh, Jean, tell us about yourself. Uh, yeah. Um... I don't know what else to say. Um, oh, I, uh, I am let, in these let, spaces. Let, let me say, I should have said, you can find me on Twitter at T Grants. Um, I, I'm not doing too much game design stuff, but you'll find me occasionally, maybe on itch, maybe through my partner's place, Jay Grants, because we do some collaborative stuff. So maybe give any links like that that you'd like to uh, provide. Sure. Um, most of my materials can be found on martianmachinery.itch.io. And I'm in other spaces, and I have some projects coming up this year that I can't talk about right now, but I can talk about later. Um, Lighthearted is one of them that I can talk about, and that Kickstarter is happening right now. Kurt Potts is the designer. So you'll want to check that out on Kickstarter. Awesome. Thanks to everybody who joined us, and we will see you soon.